During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was North Korea's lifeline, providing weapons, supplies, training, and even some limited military assistance to the North Korean government. While US and Soviet troops never clashed on the ground on the Korean Peninsula, Soviet fighters provided some limited cover over certain parts of North Korea, though refused North Korea's request to fly frontline combat support against American jets. Without the Soviet Union, North Korea would have fallen to the south and today the Hermit Kingdom and the Kim family would not exist, a very obvious win for all of humanity. Today, Russia engages in only minor trade with the internationally shunned kingdom and no longer directly finances or supports it. With North Korea owing its existence to the old Soviet Union though, could North Korea repay that favor by teaming up with modern Russia against its greatest international rival, the United States? Could North Korea and Russia team up to destroy the US? We've looked at a potential conflict between the US and Russia before and already determined that the Russian military is simply not capable of winning a war against the American military. The modern Russian military is made up of just over 1 million active duty personnel, with US forces numbering around 1.4 million. There isn't just a numbers disparity though, as there is also a training and morale disparity between the two militaries. Despite attempts to move to an all-volunteer force by the Russian military, it's still overwhelmingly made up of conscripts versus an all-volunteer military fielded by the US. Conscripts historically greatly underperform versus volunteer military forces and suffer both from morale and training issues, two things which would be of a grave concern to a Russia fighting an uphill war against a more technologically capable opponent. However, what if North Korea lent its forces to the fight? bolstering Russian numbers so that they dwarfed Americas. With an active duty military of 1.3 million, Russian and North Korean forces combined would number at 2.3 million, outnumbering the US by 700,000, a significant advantage. Of course, in a real conflict, neither side could use its full military in a conflict against the other, as both sides in this hypothetical war would need to maintain its military presences in other strategically important areas. Russia would still need to secure its eastern border against NATO's counterattack upon declaring a war on the US, as NATO's charter states that an attack on one is an attack on all, automatically triggering a declaration of war by the entire alliance on the aggressor. Without the US's homeland and overseas forces stationed outside of Europe though, NATO would be unable to prosecute a war against Russia, as Europe's militaries are simply too weak to stand up to Russia in anything but a defensive war. To make matters worse, some countries such as Canada and Germany are experiencing serious logistical issues which leaves large parts of their forces combat ineffective. In 2019, the German Air Force was incapable of sustaining the type of air operations needed in a conflict against Russia due to a lack of equipment and maintenance issues with its planes. With Canada suffering a similar issue, and a fighter shortage that left it unable to fulfill its commitments to North American aerospace defense. Still, with Russian forces elsewhere, NATO could pose serious problems for Russia, and thus Russia would need to retain a significant bulwark to deter against NATO aggression on its eastern front. North Korea also has strategic concerns that leave it unable to fully commit its forces to a fight against the US, as despite being the 25th most powerful military in the world, it faces South Korea directly across the DMZ, which it's currently ranked as the world's sixth most powerful military. The United States perhaps though has a worse strategic picture than either of these two nations, as its military forces are deployed around the world in a variety of strategic hotspots, and very often it's these military forces that ensure regional peace and stability. Its large commitment in the Middle East ensures that conflict does not arise between historical rivals such as Iran and Saudi Arabia, which would have devastating consequences consequences for the global economy. Iran's strategic goals in a potential conflict against Saudi Arabia or the US is to shut down the Persian Gulf oil trade, which thanks to the geography of the Gulf of Oman, it could easily do by threatening oil tankers with long-range standoff weapons that the US or any of its allies could do little about. Iranian special forces could even scuttle a tanker in the Suez Canal, yet another military objective of Iran in case of a war, which would choke off one of the world's most important trade arteries for weeks, possibly months. In the South Pacific, US forces help maintain the balance between China and its neighbors, with China being a particularly bad actor in the region and bullying or outright stealing territory and resources from nations like the Philippines, Vietnam, and others. China and Japan, longtime rivals, also rely on the US presence to maintain stable relationships, with the threat of American firepower backing up its Japanese allies, keeping China's behavior in check. 
Realistically, both sides could only count on perhaps half of their total military power in a conflict against the other. Though, in this regard, the US has an advantage as it has long operated its military under a doctrine that states it must be able to fight and defeat two near-peer adversaries simultaneously anywhere in the world. For this reason, the US maintains the world's largest sea and airborne mobility fleet, allowing it to quickly move forces around the world to any conflict, but also giving it the advantage of quickly replacing frontline forces in need of rest and recuperation with reserve forces stationed elsewhere on peacekeeping duties. This ability will ensure the integrity of the US frontline forces better than North Korea and Russia, who both have major shortfalls in mobility and will be forced to leave their frontline forces in theater for longer, wearing on morale, equipment, and unit integrity from casualties. Mobility is a major challenge for the Russian-North Korean alliance. North Korean mobility is all but nil, with only a token air or sea mobility force used to counter South Korean advances into its territory. Russia operates a far larger mobility command, though it is on its own barely enough to move Russian forces in significant quantities anywhere around the world and far short of what would be needed for a major offensive against a military power such as the US, with only 12 of its heaviest transport aircraft, the Antonov AN-124, in service, the only aircraft capable of moving heavy military equipment in significant quantities, Russia would be hard-pressed to quickly move critical tanks, air defense assets, and artillery to the North American continent for an invasion. Its fleet of 109 Ilyushin 276 aircraft could supplement that airlift capacity, but on their own these aircraft would only be able to move perhaps a platoon's worth of soldiers and their equipment and one main battle tank per flight. At sea, the Russian Navy doesn't fare much better, with a fleet of only about 20 landing ships with another two in reserve. Each of these ships could carry around 20 tanks and up to 425 troops, and even if Russia could muster its entire mobility fleet at once, which is not realistic as due to the maintenance and retrofit requirements, no navy on earth ever has full use of all of its ships at one time, Russia could still move 440 tanks and perhaps two regiments of infantry per sortie. Even with no casualties amongst the landing ships and no equipment breakdowns through perhaps some miracle, it would take over six months to move the entire North Korean and Russian military to North America. Deciding on where to land in the US, though, would be vital for the Russian-North Korean alliance, and there are few good options. Even if we ignored the reality of NATO or South Korea, Australia, and Japan coming to the US's defense, and Russia could concentrate its forces for an assault on North America, it would still need to get through the teeth of the American Navy. An invasion of America would require months of preparation, moving naval and air assets to Russia's west coast which would afford the US just as much time to prepare to counter such an invasion. With the US concentrating its naval forces in the Pacific, the most direct route would be the best route, with Russian-North Korean forces striking directly into Alaska to secure a foothold on North America. Anchorage would be the most ideal target for an invasion, as it holds a large deepwater port that would make it possible to quickly offload forces. An assault against any other part of the Alaskan coast would require the use of landing craft, something which is also in short supply in the Russian Navy. Invading Alaska poses several problems, as the Japanese found out in World War II. First, it's too far away from the American heartland to pose any serious economic or industrial risk to the US's warfighting effort. While oil-rich, the US would easily be able to supplement its consumption via the Gulf of Mexico or even overseas sources, and the seizure of Alaskan oil fields would result in extremely minor economic harm to the US economy. Still, with such limited mobility assets, Alaska would be the best bet for the alliance to gain a vital important foothold in North America. Russian invasion craft, however, would face the full wrath of the world's largest submarine fleet in an environment that's keenly suited for submarine warfare thanks to the turbulent nature of the Bering Sea. Even in summertime, the Bering can be treacherous to cross, and winter operations for heavy military cargo craft would be all but impossible. Anti-submarine operations in the rough seas are an extremely dicey proposition, and while Russia does maintain a capable attack submarine fleet, it's dwarfed in size and capabilities by the American fleet. To make matters worse, Russia only operates a single aircraft carrier, and the nation severely lacks an aerial refueling craft, 
As if that wasn't bad enough, only a portion of the Russian Air Force is even capable of in-flight refueling, meaning that for the crossing across the Bering Sea, the invasion fleet would be largely without air cover. The US, on the other hand, has two major Air Force installations in Alaska, Eielsen and Elmendorf Air Force bases, and in the months leading up to the invasion would quickly expand their capacity to host the rest of the significantly large American Air Force by building extra runways, hangars, and maintenance facilities. Even without its use of its 11 aircraft carriers, of which realistically only perhaps five would be available for combat ops at any one time, the US Air Force would easily defend Alaska from invasion, and with a fleet of about 450 aerial tankers, the largest in the world, American jets would have the range to cover any possible invasion avenue. With 31 AWACS aircraft or Airborne Warning and Control System in its fleet, the US Air Force would be able to supplement its land-based radar coverage to detect Russian ships and air forces at great ranges. Russia, on the other hand, only operates about 15 to 19 AWACS systems, and despite their long range, the lack of air refuel capabilities in the Russian Air Forces would mean very limited sortie rates and loitering times both. In effect, a serious deficiency in airborne radar, aerial refueling, and military transport would make an invasion of Alaska completely impossible. The logistics simply don't exist for the Alliance to make such an attempt, and with major army bases in Alaska and fast rail and airborne transport capabilities by the US, even if Russian landing craft managed to make it through the teeth of the US Navy and Air Force both, they would be completely overwhelmed by American land forces and destroyed in a very short matter of time. An attempt could be made to cross the North Pole's ice cap, though such an attempt would have to be done in winter, meaning horrible weather conditions which would wreak havoc on men and equipment both. Then there's also the problem of extended supply lines, and even with ad hoc airfields quickly built on the ice, an invasion force would still lack the air cover needed to be protected from the American Air Force. Even if, by some miracle, the Alliance managed to take Alaska, which, let's be clear, this is a complete strategic impossibility, the United States and its warfighting capability would be negligibly affected by the invasion. The Alliance would have to push into the continental US to seriously damage its industrial and military capabilities to wage war, and that would mean pushing through Canada and adding yet another combatant to the fight, as Canada would under no circumstances allow such an invasion force to simply stroll through its territory. To make matters worse, the force would have to move through very difficult terrain which would heavily favor American and Canadian defenders, and as it moved further and further south it would face even greater numbers of American Air Forces. In Alaska, American Air Forces would be limited by the physical space available on the airfields to host them. But in the continental US, the widespread number of large civilian airports and military air bases means that the vast American Air Force would still be able to be brought down on the invasion force in full effect, while Russian forces would still only be able to operate a token number of aircraft from seized Alaskan and Canadian airfields, and only operate at limited ranges due to a lack of aerial refueling assets. North Korea would be able to give Russia the numbers needed to seriously challenge the United States, but in terms of technology and additional assets, it would offer very little to the alliance. If anything, the added burden of supplying and transporting North Korean troops might even seriously damage Russia's own capabilities. After all, there is little possibility that North Korea could actually maintain the supply requirements of its vast military past a few weeks. In the end, as we've seen before countless times in these scenarios, America's homeland could never be breached by an invading force due to the current lack of mobility and logistical support aircraft and ships amongst the world's navies. If any nation on Earth were to attempt it, they would need to heavily invest in building at least as large a mobility and logistical fleet as the US, because it doesn't matter how many guns you have, if you can't move them in significant numbers quickly enough, any invasion is bound to fail. Want to see how the US would fare against the entire world trying to invade it? Check out our video US vs the world, who would win? Or check out this other video instead.